Like now he can't even get his team to tell the same lie for like a few weeks in a row. <laughs> it's just, there's a sort of charming, there's a sort of charming childish innocence in his unrelenting incompetence in every way. Anyway. Hey, you, you, want to, you want to drain the swamp by removing everyone with any qualifications? You end up with an idiot, you know? <laughs> anyway, so here we are. This is the last class. Um, because this class happens at four in the morning in China. So I'm not going to attempt to do it from China. Um, but so we'll talk about Hopper today. Uh, and you can turn in stuff till a week from today and even till the final, but it will be late. The final's already up. You can take it whenever you want. It'll stay up till 523. And uh, I will answer emails from China and try to help you with things as much as possible, but I won't attempt to have a lecture from there. Let's see, you turn yeah. in uh, the projects up to the date of the final? Sure. But they'll lose five points for being late after 512. Okay. Good. So let's talk about Hopper. Um, and this, I don't have a slide. This is really a project. So that's what I'm going to do. Let me find my project for Hopper, which is here, 7X. So Hopper is a low-cost alternative to Ida Pro. It's a pretty good one. It does not run on Windows. It runs only on Linux and the Mac. So I've got it here running on Ubuntu. And it has a free version and a pay version. The free version is quite good, but every half hour it will stop and, send it and make you restart it to irritate you. And the pay version is only $90. It is native for the Mac, but it's been ported to Linux. And it's pretty good. So let's run it here. Let me get my desktop, the button I need to oh, there's the button, good. So Hopper is here, Hopper Disassembler. And so as you have the same thing with Ida Pro and the same thing with Ollie Debug, you can open a file, but that is not opening an executable file. That is opening a Hopper configuration file. If you have previously analyzed something and you want to save all your changes, you start with read executable to disassemble. This is the same thing with Ida and other things. So you load an executable file. I've got one here. Um, this is one we used in very early projects. Let me make it bigger if I can control my machine. There we are. So um, we had this thing uh, dot slash PWD. Actually, it asks you for a password, and when you get it wrong, it says fail. And in principle, you can get it right, but there's a buffer overflow you could exploit to get in, and that's just a very simple executable. So this is, um, you start with the file command to tell you what you got. This is a 64-bit executable. I compiled it on this machine. Um, I think the one I tell you to use is the 32-bit, so perhaps to be consistent, I'll just download it again. Um, so let me get this one. I'm pretty sure that's going to be 32-bit. So let's remove this one and download that one with curl. Okay, now let's check it. Yeah, oh, it's still 64. Okay, the one I posted is 64. That's fine. We'll stick with that. So now I want to load that in Hopper. Um, and here it is. So it's going to analyze it with an ELF. This is the same thing Ida does. It now has to read the file and try to reconstruct the assembly code, and that takes some time. And you end up with this display, which is very much like what you see in Ida. There are too many panes and too much information. This one on the right has got some kind of graphic view and file information, and I find this to be useless, so you get rid of it. They know you're going to need some room, so they make it very easy to get rid of panes. That gets rid of the useless thing on the right. Now on the left, I've got tags. These are labeled points in the code. Everything starts at start. Down here is main. There's another module called test PW. So these are the names of modules and named locations in the file. Here's the strings in the file. And this thing is very simple. It says enter password, fail, and you win. So um, yeah, I see it's not projecting very well in here, but I'm afraid there is no way to make it bigger. Uh, let's see if there is such a thing as some way to make it bigger. There's window preferences, um, fonts and colors, aha. Is there, is this garbage? There, aha. There's a number I can change to a bigger number. Let's see if that does anything good. It only changes that. 
the stuff that wasn't the problem anyway. That's what I usually expect out of these things. Most of these things, just assume you have an expensive high resolution monitor and they have no mercy if you don't, because the developer has one and they forgot that the rest of us have other needs. So let me, um, I'll leave that big. Anyway, so we have strings here. I can zoom in for people in the room and the people watching remotely are pretty much hosed. Um, anyway, so that's what you have labels and strings in that pane. And if you don't need that, you can turn that off. And in the middle, you get the main thing every disassembler gives you, which is lines of code. Now, at the top, in all these products, you want to start at the top bar. This is a linear graphical representation of the whole file. Gray, this is the number of bytes in the file in memory. So the gray is the part that Hopper did not analyze. Yellow and these color-coded things are other things. The green, for example, is string constants, password, fail, and you win. The yellow is routines that Hopper was able to understand their library routines, where it was able to basically turn it back into a C function. So it figured out this is glib C start main, argument main. It was able to interpret all this and tell what library function was being called. And the blue is instructions that Hopper was not able to figure out very in any detail. You're just going to see raw assembler there. That's what's going on. And you can skim through the file this way, which is the same thing as scrolling down. The purple is data storage, blocks of data. And this is where you find good things like the PLT, the GOT. This is the, the um, global offset table, also called the program and linkage table, or a similar one. This is where the pointers are to library routines. And when you call a library routine from C, there are two steps. First, you go to procedure linkage table, which I think is the one inside C, and then you go to the global offset table, which is the one that goes to the operating system. You need two because if you upgraded your compiler, you need to change the PLT links, and if you upgraded your operating system, you need to change the GOT links. So going through two links makes it possible for each of them to upgrade independently, and this means you can upgrade your compiler and run on the same OS, or you can upgrade your OS and run the same executable. In order for them to move independently, they each need this adjustable linkage table. So, let me kill the uh, sound that's echoing back. All right, so, um, I say mute all, and then I try to close this and we hopefully get back to here. So that's the start of it. Now, um, here's other things that are worth seeing in that window. You've got back and forward buttons, just like a browser, just like Ida, because again, you're gonna be wandering through the code and sometimes you wanna go back where you were. You can go to different types of data here. Here's symbols and strings, there's the assembly language. Here's the navigation bar, very useful. And this is the so-called inspector pane with detailed information that I almost never use. And here's how you get rid of the panes you don't need if you wanna work in a small desktop. And these things are bloody awesome. And this is the main reason I ever use Hopper. So the debugger, we'll play with later, the debugger is pretty useless. It's, there are a whole bunch of products like Hopper that attempt to put a graphical interface on GDB. And I've found them all to be useless. It's better to just use GDB in command line mode. Um, but the other two are very useful. This one here is the one that creates, now let me first point out, it didn't do anything when I clicked it because I'm not in a code segment, I'm in data segments. You have to be in a code segment. So let me go back to one of the blue segments. And now when I hit this middle button, it might do something, let's try a yellow one. There, this gives you the view which is the default in Ida where you see a block of code with an arrow around it. And if there's multiple blocks, it will show you um, arrows connecting them. So let me do this the way I would normally do it. Uh, you can start from strings or you can look for green. Go to one problem with these programs is they will load and put you at the start. But the start is usually nothing but a few lines of assembly code created by the operating system which jump to main. You really want to be in main. And there are various ways to get to main. But one way is to go to a string because you know these strings are actually part of the code that the developer wrote, which I want to look at. Then double click the pointer over here. Let's go to where it uses the word fail. Now I'm back in the actual code that takes input from the user and makes decisions and might have bugs. This is the good stuff I want to analyze. And if I click here, I now see a graphical representation of the program. So this is an attempt to make it easy to understand the program by having branches just in Ida Pro, like blue is one kind of branch and this is the other branch. 
this is where most people talk about using IDA. I don't get much good out of that one in Hopper or IDA really, but it is one option to do it this way. What I really like is this one. This is the killer app of IDA. This creates C code from the assembler, approximately, and it's bloody awesome. So I did not give you the source code for this. All you have is the executable, and yet, right there is readable C. This is awesome. This is usually one of my first steps whenever I'm doing capture the flag. I download the thing, I run file to see what it is, I run it to see what it does, and then I get the C code to just read, and often that's as far as I need to go. I don't even need to go to the assembler. So here, you can see what's going on. It reads a subroutine called test PW, and then it prints out fail or win, depending on the routine, what that returned. So the real action is happening in this test PW thing. So we're not where we want to be. So let's find test PW. There are various ways to find it. One way to do it is to go here, and right there it is near main, in the, point, in the labels here. Here's a labeled thing called test PW. So I can go there. I can view here the assembly branching off boxes of junk if someone really wants to do that, which I don't much want to do. I've always find that to be not enormously helpful. This is what's usually very helpful. And so um, that, I wonder if I can zoom in on that. Doesn't look like it. Anyway, it's, this is where you get somewhat readable C code. It prints editor password, it gets input from the user, and then it has these local variables, which it doesn't have names for, so it calls them things like 20 and 24, because those are the number of bytes offset for EBP. So it has a variable equal zero. This is a loop from zero to nine, um, going up by twos, and then it does some kind of mathematics, flipping things around with all these long chains of Fs. And I know what that is because I wrote the program. It does some bitwise flipping. Because the only point of this is, I wanted this to be a little bit more challenging than just having if password equals horse, then win. It doesn't put, the password is a number, and it does some math to figure out the numbers. I remember when I gave this to Tom, one of our sharpest students, he totally figured out what it was by doing the math, which I figured would be too much bother for most people, but it wasn't for him. So that's one way to get to the answer, but of course, what's more fun is to do the buffer overflow, to trick it into printing win. But anyway, that's... This is where Hopper makes it very easy. You can read the code and see what it does. And that's the most useful feature in Hopper for me. Is that the pseudocode part? Pseudocode, yeah. Yeah. It tries to create it. You can't, it doesn't make perfect assembly code, perfect C, but it makes C where you can often spot things. So let me go back to my project here and see. The, here's where the color codes are if you care. Purple is an array of integers, green is null terminated strings. Blue is instructions, and yellow is part of a method where it was able to reconstruct the method and put it in a box and figure out how it links to the other things. So you can view the ASCII strings. You can move back to the data. Here you find the, uh, this is something we targeted in a lot of these projects. We targeted a gets at got, a, um, a GOT entry. This number here is the entry used to point to a library routine. So if you write to there, you can hijack the execution. And we did that in a lot of the projects. Now, the next thing is to see memory images in your memory layout in Hopper. Um, here's, let me try and make this the right size there. So here's a, re, here's a simplified diagram of the memory of the layout of a program. So you've got um, a big block of memory being used. There's a heap here. Then there's a stack here. You use this free memory. The stack grows down. The heap grows up. We have the data segment here, the BSS, the text segment. The text segment has the instructions. And there are often other segments as well. But that's the memory layout of the program. And you can see that with navigate show segment list. So let me get rid of the pseudocode. And it's navigate show segment list. This program has only three segments. And this is uh, external symbol puts. The segment list is pretty boring for this program, not telling us much. What's more useful is the section list, which is navigate, view, show section list. Now I see these official segments that we, you are, are similar to Windows portable executable files and initialization. Here's the PLT, the program linkage table. Here's um, the global offset table, and there's down here, here's data, and there's BSS, which is the stack. 
And so you can see the various label parts of section of segments here laid out in a somewhat friendly way. Um, most programs all think they're at a certain location. All Windows programs think they're at 400,000 because they run in a virtual memory space and it looks like this ELF is compiled the same way. All right. Now you can view a section. Let's take a look at the, um, the 400,000 section. If I go back to here, if I go to the original segment list, which is navigate, segment list, the program starts here at 400,000. I can go there and here I see the bytes, ELF dot dot. Um, you can also view them in the viewer, which is Windows Show Hexadecimal Editor. You can see this as raw hexadecimal this way. And this is just the layout of an ELF file. Remember, ping start with PNG, ELF start with ELF for executable link format, which is the Linux executable, uh, as you Windows executables start with uh, BMP. Anyway, it's so this is the text, the header that starts an executable file, then it has a bunch of parameters, and down here someplace it will have the rest of it, like here's some readable stuff, the names of routines that are called, and someplace down here it'll have, here's the uh, more references to libraries it's calling, and so on. That's the raw hexadecimal viewpoint of the file if you want that. You normally don't want that, but you might. All right. What's that? I don't think you can edit it in a hopper. You can edit it with a hex editor, which will do. Access what? Yeah, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do it with hex editor. I'm not sure you can do it in a hopper, but we're going to do that. Absolutely. Um, if you look at symbols, right, so we go to main, we've been there, and test PW, we've been there. Here we've been into the strings. Okay, we've done the control flow graph already and the pseudocode. Okay, now um, let's look at this assembly code more and modify it so we win. So we're going to look at uh, the fail. Okay, so let's go back to strings here, and here's fail. So if I double click that, I see the string fail. Fail is used here. If I double click that pointer. I go to the code that uses fail. Okay, so now I don't need that anymore. Here's what I've got. I've got move EDI, this is fail. Up here I have a jump equal, and up here I have another jump. So these jumps are what makes the decision. Now, I don't see the raw bytes of instructions here, and I would like to. So to get them, I have to go to um, preferences, which I think is window preferences, and then, uh, there is a option to show um, okay it's, it's in here let me find it um, window preferences to show those bytes and there show the hex column that's what I want under format in general there it is. It's supposedly on, but it's not working. Let me turn it off and on again. It looks to me like there's some kind of bug in the system. It's still not showing it. Um, window preferences, show the hex column. Okay, there, now it's back. These are the actual hexadecimal bytes. By the way, that's very normal. There's got a lot of bugs. Anyway, so this is the actual code that makes that instruction, BF95 and all that jazz. So, what I want to do, let me go to my instructions here, is I want to modify this program to make me always win. So, those are the instructions that um, print out the word fail. This puts fail on the stack, uh, this calls puts to print it, and this jumps somewhere else. This is the message that prints fail. So, if I want to modify the executable, um, my goal here is if I just remove all of those instructions, then it will print you win. It will try to print fail, slip past all that, and print you win. That's my goal. So I need to get rid of all these instructions from BF through 0A, and then it will always win. 
it might be a way to do it inside Hopper, but what I did was use hex edit because it seemed like the easiest solution to me. Hex edit you can install from the command line with apt install hex edit, and it's just like nano. That's why I like it. So I'm going to make a copy of pwd to pwd win, and then nano, P, uh, not nano, but hex edit. Win. Okay. And you see, this should look familiar. That's the elf and all this stuff. This is the whole thing in binary. Now all I got to do is find that string. And I think it might be control W, no, control S to search. Okay. Uh, you can't edit binaries in nano. Yeah, you got to use hex edit. If you're on a Mac, use um, hex fiend. And if you're on Windows, use HXD. Yeah, so BF95 is the first two bytes here, BF95. And if I see a 74 after it, I know I'm in the right place. So I look for BF95. And I found it, and then I have 7,400. So I found a BF95, but it's not the right BF95. I think I need the next one. Because 07, oh, that's right, is it? 0740, oh, it is the right one. Okay, good. Now I want to nuke, I think, 10 bytes, right? One, two, three, four, five. I want to nuke 12 bytes. And I want to make them 90s. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Now those are knobs. That should do it. I think it's just control X, Y. Yeah, that should do it. So now if I make it executable, PWD win, and then run it, and give it a password, I win. So that's modifying the executable. You, you analyze it with Hopper and find out how to change it, and then you change it. All right. And the last thing is that debugger, for what it's worth, we can play with that debugger. So start the debugger instead of the disassembler, and then you start hop, hopper disassembler. Okay, let me get this set up. So I'm going to leave this. I think I need to leave it and come back, I'm not really sure. But I know there are two hoppers. This is the debugger, for what it's worth. Now a server is running on port 4343. So this is, that is going to run GDB and serve it on a local network, which you then connect to with the other program. This is how they chose to implement an attempt to give you a graphical interface to the debugger. Now you open the file here with file open read executable to disassemble, and I'll do PWD again. Okay. And now, um, Before opening the debugger, we'll set a breakpoint in Hopper. So on the tag, we hit main. Okay, now we should be able to put breakpoints in. So let me give it a try. Um, if we go to main, we're here. And let me get rid of that right pane so we can see a little more what's going on here. In fact, we don't need the left pane anymore either. So here I am at the start of main. And there's a nice blue comment there. Notice this red stripe. I can put a breakpoint in by clicking in the red. Or is it double clicking? Give me a break. Right click. All right, let me read my instructions. It's not letting me do it. Um, a red dot should appear when I click it, and for some reason it didn't. Let me see what I did wrong. I started this, then I read executable to send disassemble in the symbol and strings point. Yeah. My reddish virtual stripe is not working. Okay. Then I click the debugger button. Well, that's annoying. I wonder if it has something to do with the size adjustments I've made. Like I say, I never use this thing because I find the command line to be just as useful. But, oh, it works down there. Okay. So I can set breakpoints down there. But for some reason, oh, now it's working. Okay. Like I say, pretty flaky stuff. Anyway, now that you've done that, now you can use this button and run the debugger. And this should look familiar. You're just seeing an HTML form looking version of GDB, which is all it is. You got the X, uh, registers here, RIX, RBP, and the threads and the call stack and everything there. So here we are. And now what I'm gonna do is 
continue to get it started. So there should be a, here's the continue button, I think, in here. Yep, so now it starts and proceeds to the breakpoint, and now it fills everything up. So I have um, the registers, A, B, C, and D, the stack index, the base pointer, the stack pointer, so this is the, and um, there's the instruction pointer, 400,000. This is 64-bit code. Here's the extra registers you get in 64-bit machines, 11, 12, 13, and all that jazz. Here's the segment registers we don't use much, but you know that's the game. You've got a lot more stuff here. There is a floating point unit in the processor, and it stores floating point constants. And this was important in a CTF I did a couple of years ago. They put a canary using the floating point unit values. And so I saw these weird assembly instructions at start and end, and I had to go look up what they were, and I discovered there's a whole another bunch of floating point stuff over here, and you, you can use it to put in a canary. Um, there's something mm -hmm. called MMX, which I've forgotten. Here's a raw view of memory. There's the console, which in the application output, which we're going to use later. Okay, so that's what it looks like. And I learned how to do a couple of simple things with it. So now we can step into, you remember in Ollie, you could use F7 to step into a function. So if it called a subroutine, you go in the subroutine and stop. And that's, you can do the same thing here. You can step into to go deeply into a program, or you can step over where it will go into the function, finish it, and return, and stop at the next instruction at the same level you're at. So I'm going to do step into to move into main, and it'll show the call stack here. So right now the call stack just shows main. Step into is one of these goofy things. I think that is step into. Yep, the one that has an arrow going down. This is step out, and this is step over. And those icons are kind of intuitive. So if I step into, it's going to now show main plus zero one. And that's where I am. And so it, and I should be able to see that in the disassembler window, which will be behind this. Yep, now I have moved. See, notice the color is now moved down here. And it puts RX and RIP here when you're running the debugger to try to guide you. So now if I step into again, which is here, it moves down again. So you see it stepping through the code here. Now, if I look at my code, let me get this out of the way if I can figure out how to do it. Okay. Now, so here I'm, I'm about to call a subroutine. So let's step into test PW. That should be useful. So I step into again, and now I step into here, and now it moves to test PW. And I will, there, I should be able to get it to fit on the screen well enough there. This is the start of test PW. We're just going to push something. Remember, the prologue to every function is preparing the stack. So it has to push things on the stack and adjust the stack pointer. And then you start doing things, and there'll be an epilogue at the end that restores the stack and the other registers to their initial condition. So that's the joy of graphical stepping what we've been doing in the command line with GDB. It is just a shell on top of GDB. All right, so we can go down until we have uh, hit the printf function, which should be nine more step into's. So let me bring that up here. Here's the printf function. Okay, so I wanna move down to there with step into. Okay, so I can see the color hop. Okay. And good, it moved up by itself, that's handy. Okay, now I'm at printf. Now here, I think I wanna to try to step into printf and you'll see that it doesn't work. Um, now I got to go in and come back. All right, so I can step into printf and then I can come out. Now this is what you typically done. Same thing happens with other debuggers. If you keep on stepping into, whoa, I accidentally hit something up here. I hope that doesn't matter. I think it does not. Yep, now I'm in uh, printf. And the thing about printf is it's the operating system. I don't probably don't expect to find any bugs in there, so I probably don't want to be here, so I'm going to step out, which will finish this and move up. So now it's moved back up. Now I'm back in the yellow stuff. I'm back in the code written with things like enter password in it. This is what you want to be. That's where I expect to find bugs and such. So step out, and now... I'm back to have only two lines. The stack frame 
the stack uh, call stack is here. Now I'm two levels down. I was in main and I moved into test PW. When I was in printf, there would have been three elements there. All right, now I can step over and I want to step over until uh, these lines get grayed out. So let's try that. If I step over, which is here, I'll see some lines go by behind there. Okay, there we go. And now it grays out. Now why would it gray out? There's a pretty simple reason. It's waiting for input from me. Same thing happens in all debug in Windows. It is not able to proceed because it has sent me information. And so you have to look here. Here's the application output. Enter password. It's waiting for input from me. This is their graphical input of what would be in the command line in GDB. So I have to put in a password. All right. And so put in your name and continue. Okay. So let's try that. Put in something. Press enter. And now that will appear in here. It's showing you what would appear on the screen in this strange graphical representation of a command line command. And uh, that's it. You can now step through and put in breakpoints and such with this if you want to. Um, there are a bunch of these, so apparently a lot of people enjoy this. I would rather just use the command line and GDB. Um, but this is an option. You have all this stuff, and it certainly is worth looking at. And it does make it kind of easier to spot these obscure processor features. You wouldn't even know there's a floating point unit unless you knew the right command line command to print it out inside GDB. So that's why it's good to try a few of these. Uh, another thing like this that you might want to check out is Radar A2. A lot of exploiters like it. It's a command line environment, another shell around GDB. It's not graphical. It makes it a little bit easier to set breakpoints and find overflows and exploit them. A lot of people recommend it. I went through a couple of tutorials and I thought of adding it to this class and I wasn't convinced it's worth it. That seemed to me like if you actually know how to use GDB, it's easy enough to do everything without the help of Radar A2, but it is an option. And there are a bunch of products like it that attempt to make it easier to use GDB. Um, I think just biting the bullet and learning GDB is probably more productive. But anyway, as I remember, here's another fun fact. It's very hard to get out of this. I think I often just have to kill it with the kill command at the command line. This is what usually happens when you try to get out of this. One of the many reasons I hate it. It's, and this is true of all the other buggy front ends. Um, I, I think, does this work? Yeah, this is my typical experience with it. Many reasons why I avoid it. But anyway, it is an option. And I wanted to show it to you. Hopper, as I've said, the only part of Hopper that makes me keep it and use it is that generate pseudocode. That is useful. The rest of this stuff, I can do it with GDB in the command line. <laughs> but the pseudocode is very handy. Anyway, that's all I wanted to show you. There's a project where you can do it if you like for extra credit. Um, and I think that's it. I mean, we got any questions? Yeah, can you, yeah. Can you do, do that with the, uh, Windows having a Kali virtual machine? No, it won't run in Kali. I don't believe, I think when I, I don't think I've tried it in Kali 2. I think I tried to put Hopper on Kali 1 and it wouldn't go. That's very common, by the way. If you run any program that's a little bit advanced, it won't go on Kali because it doesn't have any of all the libraries and everything. If you want to run a normal application, you want to run it on Ubuntu because Ubuntu is intended to be a desktop and it has all the support libraries. Um, in principle, you can do anything on any version of Linux, but Kali is specialized for pen testing, and it doesn't have all the productivity Ubuntu stuff. Ubuntu does work, and the Mac works. It actually works best on the Mac natively, and if you're going to do it, you don't do it in a virtual machine at all. You do it on a native Mac with a big screen, and if you're going to do IDA Pro, you do it on a native PC with two or three big monitors, and that's where the pros do. And if you, that's what Tom got to after a while. He really became an expert at IDA Pro, paid 5,000 bucks to buy the pro version of IDA Pro, and then practiced until he could really just read through the assembler. And if you do that, that's a very marketable skill. But there's a lot, a lot of learning. Yeah, Ida Pro is the main thing all the professionals use. They pay five or ten thousand bucks to get it, and then they become they watch have big monitors and they print out all that code and they step through it and figure it out and they learn how to really read executables and take them apart and modify them. That's what Tom did. Tom did that, and after about six months, he found a new jailbreak for iOS. I mean, it can be done because the number, there's stuff sitting there to be found, and very few people have 
pay their dues to learn how to really use these tools well. Read the assembler, understand it, quickly modify it, quickly find the important part. If you get that skill, that's very marketable. Uh, companies need an expert in that, but it's pretty esoteric, you know. You have to really love assembler and you have to really get good at it. I certainly would not, the first step for that would be take at least one assembler course. They have one here that I understand is pretty good now. You can take a real course in assembly language programming if you're going to go that way. Anything else? What's that? Uh, immunity. immunity. Immunity is the same thing as Ollie. All Immunity did was buy Ollie Debug's code and clean it up a little. So this, it's the same. It lets you debug Windows programs. Oh, what good is Immunity? Like you said, Hopper, the right. Yeah. Uh, well, I think immunity. See, for Windows, there is no GDB. Uh, the only choices for debugging, there is no command line debugger for Windows that I know of. Their only choices are WinDebug, Immunity, and Ollie. Those are the only ones I've ever used. And Ida Pro. So this um, Ida Pro is not a debugger; it's a disassembler. It is intended to do static code analysis, and it is the best tool for that, but it's complicated. Immunity is a debugger, like Ollie is, is it's intended to put breakpoints in and do dynamic analysis of code, where you run it and stop it, skip over a few instructions and run past it. And it's very good at that. WinDebug is the most powerful debugger for Windows, but it's hard to use. And it is kind of like this thing we just did in, 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 uh, in uh, Hopper. It is a clumsy graphical interface to what's obviously command line client. You have this one place you're typing things, you have this screen of text. I don't know why they don't just make it command line. But um, it is clumsy to use, the commands are not intuitive, but it is important because you cannot debug the kernel with Immunity or Ollie. Uh, WinDebug is the product you use if you really want to have complete control over all windows. So what I would say is a beginner typically uses Ollie because it's easy and pretty and you quickly learn. And then when you get more advanced, you move to WinDebug, which has all the full power, but it's much less intuitive. And there is no command line debugger for Windows. And for static analysis, um, I saw actually in the malware analysis class I did recently, there were guys using Ollie to just disassemble. And you can use it that way. But Ida is the main tool. So once again, I think, I think like, and that's why I structured the projects this way, script kiddies. Like kids that just want to cheat on games, they learn how to use Ollie. Because Ollie is really quite friendly. WinDebug is what serious developers use that are doing things like writing uh, device drivers and such. So those are all the tools we've been through. And Ida is for serious professionals doing real static analysis. Uh, doesn't give you much if you want only a little bit. It's like Photoshop, it's huge, and you really have to study a lot to understand enough of its features to get much good out of it. Any others? Well, I'm gonna stop the share, and I'll go up to the lab for a while and see what's happening. Oh, I have a, uh, a chat message coming in. Was able to work in a colleague. Oh, he got, he got it working on Kali. Good, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, he got Hopper to work on Kali. Good, thank you for telling me. What did you have to do? Did you have to do something special, install special libraries or something? 64, yeah. It does have to be 64. Did it just go, or did you have to install a lot of dependencies or anything? Well, I mean, oh, just, oh, good. Well, thank you. I'll put, that's news. So he says you can run it on Kali. So that's an option then. If you don't feel like putting it in a Ubuntu machine, get a 64-bit Kali and put it on there. Thank you. All right, well, I'm going to stop. Um, that's it for this class. I hope you had fun. You can still turn stuff in for another week or two. Um, and, but I won't have any more lectures. I will send an email to the people who finish, and I will try to send you some kind of certificate or badge or something to put on your website saying you finished it, since a bunch of you are not official students. In fact, none of you are official students this semester, so I will issue my own certificate. I don't guarantee that anybody will care but for what it's worth, you can have some kind of badge saying you finished my class. That's fine. Farewell. Okay. If anybody has any good clue what to use for art, I'm interested. <laughs>